Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be with you today. I am experimenting. By the way, my name is Marlene Chisholm. And as you know, I've been doing some LinkedIn Lives based on my upcoming book, From Conflict to Courage, How to Stop Avoiding and Start Leading. I plan to do some different topics later on in the year and part of next year. But for now, I'm building some content uh, to be pushing out when the book launches. So I'm glad you're here. I'm going to take a moment and it takes a while for there's a little bit of a delay. So I'm going to let you get um, settled in, grab a drink of water and please let me know where you're from. Um, I love to see your names pop up and where you're from. We've got a global audience here. It's really exciting to know that there's that many people across the entire globe that want to improve their leadership and they're resonating with this content. So I'm really excited to be here with you. I'm trying some different time zones. Uh, here's, here's one from uh, South Africa. Thank you. Uh, I don't know why your name's not showing up. That happens sometimes. There's a friend of mine, Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Looking forward to today's topic, which is about recognizing the signs of, that it's time for a conversation. Hi, Jody from Atlanta. So people are starting to filter in now. Hi there, Quinn. Camille. Okay. It's going to be busy today. We had a lot sign up from across the country today. It seems like we're getting a lot from South Africa. So there must be some people that have watched some of my uh, LinkedIn learnings. Hi from Michigan. Hi, Lisa. Okay. So I got to thinking about this. You know, part of this book is about avoidance, avoidance being the big, big problem. And, and uh, I got to thinking, well, why do we avoid? Well, there's many, many reasons. And I think that it's not always on purpose. Sometimes we know we avoid. Most of us don't like conflict, and that's because we're caring people and we like to have relationships. But when we let it go on too long, that's when it starts to get bad. And that's when we start to realize we've waited a little bit too long. And so my thought is, you're going to avoid, and not even intentionally, if you don't know how to recognize the signs that a conversation needs to happen. I have been digging deep on this, looking at mistakes I've made, looking at conversations I've avoided or have waited too long uh, to have. And so I've got some really good content here, I think, that's helped me. But what I want from you after this is over is for you to tell me what resonated the most for me for you because I'm going to be building a special report that's going to be a free download on a landing page with the picture of the book to start building that audience for when the book launches. Because obviously, as an author, when more people buy on a certain week, it's better for the publisher and so on. So be looking out for that. Hi, Cindy, South Dakota. Hi, Bill. Yes, Express Employment, one of my clients that um, I've worked with at headquarters and know many of the franchise owners. Um, based in London. Hi there. Okay, so I'm going to make this really practical at first, and then I'm going to give you some deeper insights on conversations, the signs, like how to read the signs, how to elevate your awareness to such a place that you know that you're not waiting too long. And sometimes we can overdo it. Let's face it. We can wait way too, you know, we can either wait too long or else we can have a conversation about every little thing. So I think this really means that you as a leader have to have some discernment. And I always say this to everybody who likes my content, every coaching client that I have, every corporate client. I always say that if something that I say doesn't resonate with you, throw it away. Don't use it because you are the owner of you. You're a brilliant person. You know what works for you. You know what language resonates. So set it aside if something doesn't work or even get back with me and tell me that something just triggered for you or didn't work. That gives me new distinctions about why something works in one case, but not another. In the end, you as a leader, you're responsible for yourself. So I hope I give you some tools that work for you. But if not, hey, throw them away. Okay, so I'm going to give you 10 signs a conversation needs to happen. You're welcome to add some of your own. One, as a leader, you know, is when there's a poor performer. Uh, when a poor performer is not improving, you've got to have a conversation that that's avoided often because you like them. You, you need a warm body in the seat. Many, many, many reasons. Don't want to see them cry. I have a whole chapter in this book on what I call my performance conversation model. And it is a blueprint of how to have the conversation, which, take, which takes away a lot of that dread. Let's say that I hear this a lot. Nothing changes. I've told them a thousand times. 
that means you have to have another conversation. But the retort is, I've told them a thousand times. And I jokingly say, that means you've allowed it 999 times. A lot of times that has to do with a lack of accountability instead of just the telling, or it has to do with you're making them believe it's a choice when in fact a decision has already been made. I just did a post not long ago, uh, don't confuse appeasing with collaboration. You know, if you're appeasing, that's not collaborating. If a decision's already been made, you are the leader. Make sure that your employees know the decision has been made. The collaboration may be about process or when or how, but a lot of times we avoid conversations. Another one is walking on eggshells. If there's someone in your world, whether it's your boss, a colleague, you're on a board of directors. If there's someone that's sort of a bully, that's just brash and, and unaware, and you're walking on eggshells, it's time for a conversation. And you know what? You don't want to have one whenever you're in that kind of situation. I know. Here's another one that happens in personal relationships. They seem kind of distant. Something's off. But we just kind of pretend, we tiptoe around it, and we act like... Um, we act like uh, that, that we understand. Is Can anyone else not hear? Let me know because someone's saying they cannot hear me. Um, hi there from India, from the state of Maryland. We'll have to just redo this, I guess, if there's something wrong with the audio because it's sounding like it's working to me. Okay. And so I'm going to go on. Um, someone's taking advantage of you. You feel resentment. We'll talk about that in a little bit. You just know that it's just not an equal relationship. Maybe you notice passive aggressive behavior aimed at you and you don't know for sure if um, good, there's people saying they can hear. So glad. Okay. That was a good check. And that kind of threw me off because that's happened to me before. It's technology, right? I'm still kind of new at this. So thank you for sharing that you weren't hearing, but maybe you can listen to the replay later. Um, so if you feel like someone's taking advantage of you, it's really hard to bring that up because sometimes you don't know whether you're being too sensitive um, or whether it's really them. So there's this narrative going on. Uh, and I'm just giving you here just some list to kind of spark your um, attention here. And you're welcome to um, share with me what you what you've learned over your course of leadership about how, you know, it's time for a conversation and you used to miss it. Here's another one. This one's hard. You're intimidated by someone's brash behavior. These, these places where we feel intimidation or that someone's a high conflict or they're aggressive, that's really difficult because we kind of already know what they're going to say because we have life experience. I've got some uh, ways to work through that. Whenever you already know what they're going to say, you have to let them say it because that's just who they are. You still have the job, though, of representing yourself instead of pretending it's okay. Um, someone hasn't fulfilled their promises. Even if you have agreements, sometimes someone doesn't get back with you like they're supposed to. I've had to learn this as a consultant, that even though there's an agreement and even though there's deadlines and timelines, we're equal partners and people have to fulfill their agreements before my work is going to be good and be a benefit to them. When it's one-sided and maybe as a consultant, if I'm treated like a lower level employee or I'm paying you so I get to tell you what to do, I know now that's time for a conversation before we move forward because it never works for me. It never works whenever the work I'm doing is not seen as partnership. So that's a little different from probably most of you out there where you are leading inside of a company, but I still lead. It's just a different way of leading and it's more partnership. It's more working with high level. We've decided we've put together contracts, but when the power shifts whenever you start noticing that you're not treated as your with your expertise, that's a problem. And you have to clarify that or else there's going to be problems later on if you avoid it. Another one is they're way too needy and the relationship has become codependent. I know that this happens with middle level managers because they are in the middle and they are working between the top and the, the bottom and they're trying to bridge that gap and trying to execute. And sometimes Everybody on every side becomes needy. The top level becomes needy. Um, and then the the frontline leaders are always coming in their open door and the open door becomes a revolving door. So those are issues where you know that a conversation needs to happen. Hi there in the UK, David. Love the anger management training. Thank you so much. Uh, I've had a lot of people take that lately, and I don't know whether it's a required course or whether we're all just noticing that we're all pretty angry. <laughs> I think there's a lot of anger in the world and we and we judge it. 
Uh, yes, here's one that says, uh, Garuba um, says some become defensive when presented with the facts. Absolutely. Um, and so thank you all for just chiming in here. I'll check in every now and then. Hi from Cyprus. Uh, you're so welcome. Glad you're here. All right. So um, those are just 10 little um, situations that I want you to think about. Now, are you going to memorize those 10 situations? No. Part of the work I do is really making things super clear and easy and simple so that, um, yeah, it was good academic knowledge. It was a good reminder. But like, how do I remember this? Well, I'm going to give you two easy ways. So the first way is that the way that you know a conversation really needs to happen is generally you want something to stop, you want something to start, or you want something to change. So I'm going to say that again. You want something to stop, you want something to start, or you want something to change. So let's just take a few of these. A poor performer doesn't improve. You need, for whatever behavior is not working to stop, you need them to change and you need, need them to start doing something else. In the book, I'm going to give you specific blueprints of how to determine what that is. Okay, um, let's say someone's taking advantage of you. Well, obviously, you need that to change. You need that to stop whatever the behavior is. But I want you to notice that if you can't articulate the behavior and if you can't articulate what you want, it's going to be really difficult to have that conversation because you're fuzzy in your mind. You're going off of an experience that you can't articulate. So think about, I want something to stop. I want something to start. I want something to change. Let's say that you're getting blamed for things outside of your control. I think I might have missed that in the 10 because I'm actually reading off of it. If you're getting blamed, you want that to stop. You want something else to start, which is shared responsibility. What you need to change is the way people see things. So there's just an example of stop, start and change. And I want you to start thinking about that as you process through your leadership journey. When you think something's off, something's off. OK, what needs to change? What needs to start? What needs to stop? Once you get used to thinking like that, you sort of thin slice it and you get to it easier. But I'm going to share with you what every single one of these issues have in common. And I'll say this, that as a consultant, I work with very, very intelligent, bright people, very smart people. And what happens when you get a coach or a consultant like we, me, I can see things that you can't see. And it's not because I'm smarter. It's because I have a certain amount of training in a certain topic and I'm not in the midst of the emotion. When we're swimming in emotion, it's very difficult to work your way out of it without a little support. So that's my role is I try to help leaders get gain clarity on what's happening that they don't want to have happen, what needs to start, what needs to stop, clarity on the end result, clarity on how that aligns with the mission. So that's the role of a coach or a consultant, not really to always give advice or tell you what to do, because in the end, like I said, you have to make choices that are aligned with who you are, with your culture, with all, all these other elements, and no one person can give you that answer. So I wanna give you what all of these issues, these 10 issues, plus the stop, start, and change have in common, emotions. So another easy way to notice signs that a conversation needs to happen is through emotions, feelings, thoughts. So I've got some here I want to talk about. The first one is resentment. Because when you need something to change, let's say you've been taken advantage of, let's say your open door is becoming this revolving door, let's say you're getting blamed for things outside of your control. If you don't notice how you're feeling about that, You'll brush it off and say, that's just our culture. That's just the way it is. It's going to get better. We're going through change. And you're going to be finding yourself in resentment. On the flip side, when you're coaching your employees and working with them, if you start to notice resentment, it's time for a conversation, even if you don't have resentment, but you notice it. So how do you notice it? You notice it by passive aggressiveness, by snide remarks, by sarcasm, by people not fulfilling things and saying things like, well, at least now you know how it feels or welcome to my world. Resentment is an anger that leaks out. And so it's a little bit different than anger, but it's more suppressed. Um, and someone said this must have been back. I think a great way to start a, uh, a conversation. Hello, so-and-so. I want X to stop, start, change. Can we talk about it? It has to be better than we need to talk. Yeah, I, I agree with the we need to talk. In fact, let me share this. I love where you're going with this, whoever that LinkedIn user is. If you want to put your name in the next box, um, I think maybe if you're not following me or if you're not connected to me, maybe it just shows up as LinkedIn user. I'll ask LinkedIn to see what's going on there. What I usually do, and I'm teaching this in the book, is like, I'd like to speak with you today about 
at, you know, like at two o'clock. And my intention is to talk about the X, Y, and Z and see how we can get aligned, something to that extent. In other words, using intention to set the framework for the conversation, because I think we need to talk can sometimes trigger this emotional response of, am I in trouble? What's going on? Oh my God, it must be awful. So I like to set an intention to give clarity to where the conversation's going so that people feel like we're on the same. Hi, Amy. Yes, Amy. Amy and I talk a lot on LinkedIn. So glad you're here. Um, anyway, so yes, I agree that can, instead of can we talk, is like I've, I've noticed or I have an intention and that's a whole other way of teaching that I'm going to do in the book. And maybe I'll have some LinkedIn lives on that as well. But I want you to start thinking about resentment, thinking about how you start to behave when you feel resentment. We don't even notice our behavior sometimes. Sometimes it turns up in we can't wait to call a friend or an ally to talk about what so-and-so did and get their agreement. But the reality is talking to someone else about what someone else did um, won't help you change it. You have to talk to the person. Uh, it can help to process it with someone else, but sometimes it turns into gossip. I've been guilty of it too, even with as much as I know. It's human nature to be hurt and want to be understood. So it's not about judging yourself or saying, oh, they gossip. It's about saying there's resentment there, which is a sign that we need to have a conversation. I want to share something kind of interesting early in my career. Um, used to when I was learning how to price and how to build proposals and, and whatnot, sometimes um, I would get someone on the other end that wanted to negotiate. That's a fair business practice. They would want my prices to be different than they were. And I often felt resentment. And so I want to say the reason I felt resentment was because of the way I processed that request. Hi there. Um, the, the reason that I felt resentment is I, my narrative was they must not value me if they don't want to pay the full fee. Now, see, that's just my narrative instead of saying, well, it's business. Obviously, sometimes people have budgets or they want to negotiate or they want to figure out a better pricing strategy. And I used to get angry, um, but then I decided to start interpreting different. When I felt resentment, I would interpret and plan to say, well, I can't do that, but here's what I can do. That totally changed my experience and I no longer felt triggered if there was negotiation on the table. It's just negotiation. It's just business. So some of our triggers happen because of the way we process information. Um, here's Anne says how to um, handle getting blindsided by a supervisor on something that's not your responsibility. You know, that's a great question. And I just wrote, I want to send you to a place um, where I just wrote about being blindsided on Smart Brief for Leadership. Go there, Smart Brief for Leadership, Marlene Chisholm. I wrote about that. I want to say this, that's when you set up a conversation. You don't say it in the moment. You say, hey, I'd like to have a conversation about uh, some issues that have just happened. Um, and I was in the mix of that. And I want to talk about how we can get better understanding on what's going on. Because if you set the intention to get clarity on it, then in your meeting, you start once again from that clarity. And then you say, I've noticed that many people thought this was something that had to do with me when in reality it wasn't. Let me share the facts. So that's just an entrance into that conversation. There's some conversations you can't have in the spur of the moment. You have to plan and you have to go um, you have to go to that person and plan a conversation. I will be sharing that blueprint in the book. Hi there. Um, so let's, um, so resentment. So that's one of the, one of the indicators. And so I'm looking at this from the standpoint of your own resentment, but I'm also presenting this from the side of you feel no resentment, but you're noticing things that is coming out of the other person's mouth that indicates that, that they have resentment. That's a conversation. That conversation can start very simply with, hey, you know, Julie, Ken, whatever the person's name is. I've noticed lately that when I've mentioned X, Y, and Z, you always say, a, B, and C. The story I'm telling myself is that your resentment, you're resentful about something or that you don't agree. Walk me through what's going on for you. If nothing more than being curious about someone else's behavior, it brings to light that you've noticed. Once you've noticed, generally, I will tell you what people normally do. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm just teasing. That's just you being sensitive. 
most of the time people will avoid responsibility because most people don't bring the elephant into the room. And when you do, you become such a clear and honest communicator. If it's, if you're doing it in a non-threatening tone and if you're doing it from a place of curiosity and I want us to be on the same page from that space, from that mentality, it, it shocks people because they're ready for war and they've been at war with you through their resentment. So just know that it's not about going, yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Let me tell you three times. It's not about that. It's about saying something I've noticed and the way that I'm interpreting that. So are you noticing here as I'm sharing this with you that I'm taking shared responsibility? Okay, so I'm going to look over here real quick. Does anybody have anything they want to say? I'm, I'm looking at the posts. Um, I've got a little bit more. I've got another couple of emotions I want to share. And then the, the two conversations I want to wrap up here in about seven minutes. Okay, I don't see anything coming in right now. So. Um, Anger. I do have a course on anger management in, on LinkedIn. I've had so many people say this has been so helpful to them. And I was very excited to get to do this program because I felt like I had some anger problems. And um, I learned a lot through the research and it's been a part of my work since then. Um, and so a lot of times clients would connect with me and they would say, you know, I've got an anger problem. It's interesting how we're really, really embarrassed um, about anger. And so I would say you don't necessarily have an anger problem. You have an awareness problem because once you elevate your awareness, you can build a plan and change old programming. So I've got a question here. Uh, what's the success rate of having one of these conversations? In my opinion, they have already become disengaged and resentful. will continue to undermine you. The goals of the company or the team, it's more of a formality before discipline or termination. Hey, Quinn, thank you for that question. The model I'm using has had a very, very, very high success rate with my clients because, and you brought it up, the intention is not about discipline or termination. And that's what I mean about a conversation needs to happen. If you're waiting until you're so angry that all you want is to discipline and write them up, they know it. If you have a conversation well before and you are there to help them, and that is your real goal is to course correct, it works. I would say it works 90% of the time. And I haven't done a formal measurement, but I've worked with a large franchise system, had a lot of success with that. It works 90% of the time. And if the times that it doesn't work, when you've gone through this process, that person generally knows you've tried, it's not a good fit, and they quit on their own and you remain friends. And so um, I think that a lot of times we hold so much resentment and we wait so long and then it becomes about, oh, HR said, let's make sure we document. So my method is about let's have the conversation sooner rather than later. And the documentation is just part of the process. It's not punitive. It's not for an intention to where I won't have a legal issue now that we need to fire. The documentation is what I've tried to do as a coach and as a leader to help you get to where you need to be. So I hope that that's, that's helpful um, for you. Here's one. Uh, Laureen says, I find my emotion of dread prevents me from saying any things in terms of initiating. Absolutely. You're not alone. Um, people will talk about you before they talk to you. You're, you're so right. And um, I've been there too in that dread, but I've learned that if I can be courageous and the dread is that that's my emotion. And when I say, well, I know what they're going to say, that is true. I probably do, but my job isn't to analyze that is to say what I need to say and to let people be where they are. I've done some of these lessons on releasing resistance, and that's part of the method I'm going to be teaching in this book too. It is scary. Those feelings are bad, and that's what keeps us from having the conversation. But what I have seen is if you have a blueprint, if you have methods, if you have the right mindset, it is such a relief to actually speak the truth, get it off your chest, come to agreement and work together. It's so wonderful you become such a competent leader and you expand that conflict capacity. So, you know, the anger comes out in verbal outbursts and um, physical outbursts. Sometimes there's a lot of anger in our world right now. And anger is a whole other beast because it's elevated at that point. So we have to sometimes set a boundary with anger and we have to be able to um, not walk on eggshells, but timing is very important. So I'm going to look at it from the standpoint of your own anger. If you're feeling angry, it's time for a conversation. But the conversation usually is about setting a boundary. It's about something you've allowed or it's something that you want that you don't think you're going to get if it's your anger. 
If it's someone else's anger, it's generally an interpretation they have about who you are or what your motives are. So if you can understand the energy of anger, I often say anger is not the truth, but it's the fuel that can get you there. Anger is just energy that wants to go somewhere. And if you can know that, you can start to control your own anger. Um, what about a staff undermining you and recording you without your knowledge? Ooh, wow, I that's a bigger than what I can say here, Jody. Um, you feel like you're being baited. I would just bring that up. I would have a conversation with people to say, you know, last time um, that we had a meeting, you were recording and I wasn't aware of that. And th my sense is that you don't trust me or that I'm being baited. I want to talk about it. What is going on that made you feel you had to do that? From this, I would have the conversation and be curious. I don't know what your recourse is for that. I would talk, it depends on your company, um, but really this is an issue of trust. This is an issue, I would say, set the intention if I want to rebuild the trust, because obviously if you're recording me, you feel that I can't be trusted. Either I haven't fulfilled some promises or you're experiencing it that way. When we get more curious about it and, and instead of angry, that's when we do a better job in our conversations. So I'm sorry that's happened to you. That would be devastating. And I don't know all the circumstances and I have to answer it here, but thank you for sharing it. Uh, termination without the process and conversation is at a very expensive, absolutely, it's so expensive. And what really is better for everybody, including leaders, is to have the conversation quickly when you notice something instead of after you're so irritated. And just to tell someone, I've told them a thousand times, without follow-up and accountability, that conversation is probably not going to be taken very seriously. Um, so I hope I'm like planting enough seeds for you all to know where I'm going on this. And so blame is another one. And I'm just going to briefly talk about blame. If we're blaming other people for our experience as leaders, then we're not modeling empowerment. And if, which I'm sure you have employees that are, that feel not empowered, that are disempowered. Um, my goal when I'm working with someone is to help them find their choice. I always say, when you find your choice, you find your power. And responsibility, the first part of responsibility is the recognition of choice. So when people easily resort to blame, that tells me they're not a creator of their own experience. And part of my mission is to help people become the creative force in their own life. Because if you're not the creative force in your own life, you're going to be living and acting as a victim no matter how many opportunities you have. And I think it's the biggest disservice we can do to ourselves to see ourselves as victims and to see others as victims. And I do believe there's a distinct between being victimized and identifying with victimhood. And so I'm really making those distinctions in the book. So when you see someone that's doing a lot of blaming, that is a huge red flag. You've got to intervene. If you find that you're doing that, ask yourself what your choices are and what you've been settling for and see if you can't get out of that mindset because that will never get you to where you want to go. I've been a big blamer in my life. I've been in the victim mindset. I've been there. I know that story. And I work with people who are struggling with that. But once you start to see your choices, you really truly see that you have a lot of options. Options. And the option may be to leave where you're working and get in another culture. But nonetheless, we all have choices and we don't like all of our choices. But blame is an idea. It's a feeling. It's an experience that that a conversation needs to happen, whether you're seeing blame or whether you're experiencing it for yourself. So I know we're running out of time. I've promised this would just go 30 minutes. I'm going to give it like a couple more minutes um, and just give you the rest of this, which is two conversations you need to have. We've already talked about a little bit about the conversation with the other person. Set the date. Set the date first, even if you don't know what you're going to do. If you'll do that, it will pressure you to get some preparation. So set the date, ask the person for a conversation, put it on your calendar, set the intention. My intention is and make the intention coming from a place of unity, coming from a place of resolving the problem, coming from a place of we'll be better after this, not from the place if you were wrong and I'm going to tell you what you did. Your intention is everything in a conversation. Um, and so then the third one is to understand if you need to set boundaries or ask for something. And then, of course, it's about accountability. So that's like sort of the short version, the overall version of speaking with someone else. Um, yes, let people know we're available to have a conversation. Yes, yes. And you know what? I'm glad you brought this up. I had a client not long ago. I want to just say this quickly. In some cultures, it's seen as undermining if you're talking with people in other departments. So I want to bring that up. 
um, because I'm of the standpoint of we should be talking across departments, but I just had someone say this was causing a problem. So you have to be really careful um, if someone at a lower level is coming to you complaining about their boss. You have to encourage them to go to their boss because if you're not careful, that becomes undermining and it's not intentional or it'll be seen that way. So I hope that that's helpful, just that one little piece. But I totally agree. We, we need to talk with each other, but there is chain of command and we have to be careful that we're not, you know, overstepping on someone else's territory. And um, so the finally, I want to end with this. Most of the time, the other conversation we need to have and we need to have this one first is the conversation with ourselves. And because if we always look to the outside and we always think the conversation needs to be about the other person and what they did, that might be jumping the gun a little too quickly. So the first conversation, of course, is with yourself. You want to question your assumptions. You want to get facts. You want to challenge your interpretations. Just like I told you, I challenged mine that when I felt resentment, um, I realized that I need to interpret this differently because our narrative, I'm doing a lot of work on narrative and identity in this book. And so I want you to understand that the way we interpret is going to be the way we behave because we believe what our mind tells us. We see something, we have an instinct about it, and we might be right, but there could be all kinds of other interpretations. So when I'm coaching someone, I'll say, come up with five different scenarios that can be equally true. Because if you don't know, you really don't know. It's just what your intuition is telling you. Great to have intuition, but check your assumptions. Get clear on what you want in your mind, in your head, instead of blaming them and pointing at what they're doing wrong. The opposite of that, opposite of that is what you want. Be able to articulate that. Thank you so much. I'm getting lots of good compliments here. Thank you. And I will be playing these right after this. So if you want to say a few points, you can. Um, and own your part. How did you somehow contribute to this? Did you act like everything was okay? Did you say it'll all blow over? Did you agree to something that you knew you weren't going to do because you wanted to appease in the moment and you didn't have the energy? If we circle back around and say, okay, I didn't address this when it came up and we're both in this and I'm part of this. So clean slate. If you can have the conversation with yourself, self, excuse me, before, um, before you have conversation with other people, you can come from a very clear and respectful place instead of I'm right, they're wrong. And I just took a course on how to have conversations. Um, so have the conversation with yourself first. Make sure that you're from coming from a centered place. Get your sleep, eat good, get yourself stable and then get clear. Um, and there's a lot more to this, of course. There's blueprints and so on. But um I would love, love, love to hear from you. And I'm going to, uh, I would like to hear from you on this level. I've decided to build a special report about this content that we did today so that I can be a little more linear, go a little more in depth. I plan on having a special web page where people can go sign up and download this report about how to know it's time for a conversation. It'll be a lot of what's in this today and maybe some new distinctions and some new references and so on. So if there's something that's specifically resonated with you or you want more of, let me know in this chat or you can go to my LinkedIn and direct message me if you want to. Um, that will help me to make this a really good piece because it's going to take several hours to build this and it's going to be something free. I'm hoping it, it um, creates interest for the book, you know, before it launches. That's my job as an, as an author is to make book sales happen for the publisher. And um, they don't, they don't let you write a book unless they think you can sell it. <laughs> so. Um, Anyway, thank you so much. I hope it's a great resource. Hi, Carlos. Um, so if you want to, uh, you can also follow me. That way you're going to get updates on when I have these lives. I try to do two a month. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to this month. but um, Or you can go to MarleneChisholm.com and you can sign up. I've got something that's a download that's free right now. That's getting ready to go away. But I would love for you to be on my mailing list. Um, we do a newsletter you know, uh, every single Monday. Um, so anyway, uh, glad that you're here and I'm just going to hang out to just see what comes in from people. And um, I will see you next time. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Quinn.